Jingle Jangle. <laughs> hey, Mr. Jingle Jangle, play your songs for me. Welcome to Beach <laughs> with the <laughs> Bucks. <laughs> Welcome back, everyone. We just started off with a second song. We have our customary uh, intro song and then uh, our new scat section at the beginning of the, <laughs> <laughs> the podcast instead of uh, our outro scat as we normally do. Welcome that back. That was just a, a, full, a full song by Jamie. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, and and we're uh, we're all the better for it on this episode. We are back on part two of our talk about Omen Setter's Luck by William H. Gass. It's going to be an interesting one. We got a lot to discuss, but before we get into that, we got a couple other things to discuss, uh, including some thematic beers on this first day of October over here in our household. Who wants to start the what are you drinking section? Don't start with me because mine is not thematic. <laughs> <laughs> I can start. Um, I am drinking a hazy IPA from Rogue Brewing Company. Uh, and the beer is called Bat Squatch. And it's got a picture. <laughs> Of a bat squatch on it. It's definitely primed for spooky season. It's very scary um, and very good. I genuinely really like this IPA. It's yeah, kind it of good. sweet. Um, they have other spooky season beers also from uh, what it sounds like. There yeah, I are think maybe they're more. just a spooky brewery. I think these are always on tap. <laughs> Well, like I think they're they're just ex- a permanent. <laughs> they're extra good right now, uh, and this is the perfect time to plug the Instagram for Beer Time with Books, so you can see that can. It is at Beer Time with see Books. That? See that? See can. that can? <laughs> we also posted pictures of Oliver today, so you can go look at him. Yes, the the new dog that has uh, made some noise on the last episode and may continue to make <laughs> noise in all of the episodes upcoming. Uh, just because I'm drinking the same thing, I'll go next. I am also drinking the Rogue Bat Squatch. Again, good beer. Check out the can. It's spooky season, <laughs> y'all. We are having a good time here at the beginning of October. I really like um, very spooky and very good as a review for a beer. <laughs> yeah, that That is all you need to know about this beer. This beer is, is very spooky. Um, I, on the other hand, am holding on to the dregs of summer with a, a light Sauvignon Blanc. <laughs> is this, is this uh, another episode of Beer Time with Books and Wine? Beer time with books and wine. Ooh, that's the third. That's the third song of the episode <laughs> we have now hit. So, uh, beer time with books and wine for anybody that knows that. I guess that's our other sub podcast. Is it's beer time with books and sometimes we dive into beer time with books and wine. It does have its own theme song. It does. So that's true. We're, we're in another episode of it's a, beer it's time a with books and wine. Of this pod. We, we need um, we need to go I'm, back and track how many there have been thus far of what episode of beer time with books and wine we're actually on. I think that'd be a uh, fascinating. I don't know that we've had a beer time with books and wine this season. I don't yeah, think I don't so. think so. We, I think we had multiple. First season. Yeah, multiple first season, but I want to say well, this, this is, is maybe just the third or fourth episode. Yeah, but it's definitely enough to be a series. Like it's getting up there. Well, it's happening. Um, I uh, am drinking a so a summery Sauvignon Blanc by Bontero. Hey, so hold on to it while you can. It's we're I'm, we still got warm days before it gets I'm, to. Uh, I'm feeling the summer nostalgia. Yeah, hold already. on to that before we get into the winter of COVID. Can't wait for that. <laughs> oh, so no. with that, on that cheery note, let's get into the next section of recent media. Uh, just one or two pieces of media since the last episode that really uh really brought you some joy. That that's the prerequisite on this episode. What brought you joy? Oh, I have some <laughs> joy for you. Um, Brian and I did a deep dive into a reality television show. It was very um, unexpected. It took us by surprise. It was very unexpected. We have a uh, a cursory acquaintanceship with a contestant on this reality show. Uh and so we felt we needed to watch. I'm not going to say who. I would never. Are you going to say the show? Yes. 
Um, so the show is Love Island. It was the second season of Love Island in the United States. We had never watched it before. We started because we knew somebody. Um, and I I got sucked in so quickly. And Brian, Shock. I think, would agree. Shocker. It, it's a fascinating show. It the the concept <laughs> is so simple but so compelling. You just it's a bunch of people that need to couple up or else they're out and it's just and they do it's fascinating the <laughs> politics that come on and there is a cash prize so it's like a dating show but also a game show which is yeah. hilarious the finale was last night and our our favorite couple won and it was very exciting so that's brought me a lot of joy um recently also i've been listening to a podcast um that I had heard of before because it's on the same podcast network as a lot of the pods that I listen to. But the hosts of it were guests on the Dungeons and Dragons podcast that I believe I talked about in the last episode. And then I, it led me into this one. But it's called Hey Riddle Riddle. Um, and it's three improv comedians who try to solve riddles. Um, and they're really bad at it. And it's entertaining and has brought me joy. They also do like little improv skits throughout. If they make a dumb guess, then they like normally have to play that out as a scene. Um, and it's very good. It's very fun. I highly recommend if you want just like absolute nonsense in your ears, uh, which I think we all need <laughs> <laughs> right now. Absolutely. But that's that's my stuff. Cool. Uh, for mine, mine was Joy Through Nostalgia. The Tony Hawk Pro Skater 1 and 2 remake came out, and those games were such a huge part of my childhood. Uh, I've skated a lot over the years, even within the last few years, uh, and it was just like seeing all the levels in the way. People talk about this as a common thing with games when you're like thinking back on them, that they look so much better than they actually were because like your imagination is filling in the rest of it. But in this case, it's like they actually look good <laughs> when you're playing them. So that's fun. Uh, and then the soundtrack for them, you know, definitely hits more onto like the punky side. And that got me into some of the music at first from like mid 2000s pop punk and stuff like that. And then it's just progressively gotten darker and darker and darker. <laughs> And I'm now into some really uh, heavy stuff. But I think it's bringing me joy in such a tumultuous year to just <laughs> funnel it through <laughs> this dark music with six, seven, eight, nine string guitars. I um, told friend of the pod, Emily, she was a guest last season. From the Underground Railroad episodes. From the Underground Railroad episodes. I told her about Brian's current music listening habits, and she told me that it was a cry for help. It so. may be. It may be. <laughs> you said things that brought you joy. <laughs> that's bringing me joy. It's bringing me joy. So that's uh, been a little bit since the last episode. Danny? Um, I, uh, speaking of dark uh, things. Um, Will dark, and I dark things have, that bring you joy. <laughs> yes, no. Will and I have been watching. Uh, okay, all right, I, I I think we were watching it last time. Um, the this German show on Netflix called Dark. You were. Yeah. Um, yes, and we are actually one episode from the very end. We have one episode left. Um, it's just so much to deal with, but it continues to bring me joy. Um, <laughs> it's so. Uh, it's so creative and, um, the, there's a lot of, there's a lot of time travel involved and it's very complicated. So I'm looking forward to being able to read all of the spoilers on Reddit after, um, we finish the episode because there's a lot to unpack as they say. <laughs> um, and as they one say. of the things that is most brilliant though, is that, uh, you see, you often in the show see the future selves of the characters that you meet in the first season and you see their past their past selves or like their parents from other years other decades other centuries even and they do the most phenomenal job of casting like these people in multiple in like different decades and in in different parts of their lives it's i just recently learned that one person we have been seeing as like a middle-aged man and as a very old man are not the same person <laughs> uh and it's just i don't know it's 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 what they've been able to do with the casting has been great so um i really loved it i 
Uh, it's three seasons, and um, we're finishing the last episode tonight. Um, post pod. Um, well, shoot, we gotta we gotta wrap this up then. <laughs> yeah, it's late. <laughs> no, we no, no, it's fine. I mean, uh, so um, uh, so yeah, that has been one thing, and um, I also just read Americana by Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie, and it was phenomenal. Um, it was it was just great. I have. Um, I don't know. I have a lot of good things to say about it. I think there's some mixed reviews on Goodreads, um, but I really, really enjoyed it. And uh, I, um, I don't know. I just love the way that the author talks about her experience um, living in Nigeria and also the United States. And um, she has a lot to say about race in America specifically. And I just, um, I don't know. I really enjoyed it. So I, I really recommend that book. I think in this present moment, <laughs> it's important uh, to be reading black authors uh, and all the time also. Um, and I would really recommend that book if you're trying to get into, um, uh, I don't know, some more, uh, some more black authors. Um, I would recommend that one. Nice. Well, we're going to get into not a black author, a very white, <laughs> a very white setting. Extremely white. <laughs> up in Extremely not black author. Thank you for that segue. <laughs> Just to be very clear of where we're at on this one. Um, uh, yeah, we are going to move into the second part of Omen Setter's Luck by William H. Gass. Uh, this is going to be interesting. I'm curious to hear what you guys have to say, especially on some brief bits that I've heard uh, since the last episode. Um, but as we had done last time, and as is um, the normal ordering here, we're going to get into a summary, but I'm going to do kind of a quick one where we're just hitting broader points, and then we can get into some of the finer points if you'd like on the plot. You know, if there's stuff that gets glossed over during the summary section, we can discuss it together, um, especially because I think there is a lot you could get into in some of this um, <laughs> if you so wanted to, which I don't know that we necessarily want to on some of it because it gets uh, into some pretty crazy places. But where we left off last time, um, there was trouble amiss with Henry Pember, who was the subject of our second section. Uh, so we had read through the first section and then the second section, uh, and we were in the Reverend Jeff Throw Ferber's Change of Heart, uh, for this third section. And so we learn that Henry Pember has gone missing uh, and the townsfolk have lots of conversations at lots of different people's houses. We get Jethro Ferber going over to Lucy Pember's house. We get Omen Setter going over to Jethro's place. We get the townsfolk going all over to Omen Setter's place. This is all, you know, everyone going back and forth trying to figure out what's going on with Henry Pember, what they think happened to him, uh, who they think caused him to disappear and subsequently uh, be hanged. Uh, we learn later that Henry is hanging from a tree uh, out in the woods. And all the while, we're in the middle of uh, Jethro Ferber's section, and we have multiple instances here where he's talking to Bracket Omen Setter and... Omen Setter is asking Ferber to tell the townsfolk that he has found the body, but that it wasn't him. But Ferber is then going around and really working the town into thinking that it was. We had seen from the last section that he had some grudge against Bracket Omen Setter, and it really comes to a head here where he is essentially turning the town against him to think that Bracket Omen Setter had to do with Henry Pember's ultimate demise. Uh, in the middle of all of that, we do get more into Jethro Ferber's brain, especially during the sermon, uh, which was really interesting to see him in the heat of the moment there. Uh, we get more into some of the other areas that we focused on <laughs> in the last section of some of the uh, more erotic corners of... <laughs> the reverend's mind uh and ultimately at the end um while the townsfolk are still trying to figure out exactly what has happened to henry uh omen setter goes missing after telling everybody that his son is sick uh and is going to die 
and Oma's head are just gone, and eventually they find the body. Omen Setter leaves the town. The baby ends up actually fine. Uh, and it ends up with quite, uh, as we'd kind of mentioned before we started recording, kind of a um, really easy ending here where it didn't really come to as much of a head, which we can discuss how much we think about that, but didn't come to as much of a head as maybe I had expected it to. Um, and ultimately, in, in the end, we do find that um, Jethro Ferber does pass away at Mm -hmm. the end so i think that is just a broad uh summary there just to hit a few points um and like i said we can start getting into that with this discussion here Uh, but the thing i kind of want to hit on is you know first to to ask you guys about just to get it warmed up a little bit is we got to jethro ferber's section and we had discussed that this was going to be the rest of the book i recall phrases of like buckling going down in the last episode because it seemed like it was going to be this very stream of consciousness um ending and like potentially descent into madness uh and i didn't think it quite got there but i just kind of wanted to get your guys' thoughts on how the section actually ended up to end the story um and how that kind of related to what your initial introduction was to his section and and how you kind of felt about it now that we got to the end um, of the arc of Jethro Ferber. I was... Yeah. (laughs) Oh, no. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, You you go. go. No, I always go first. I always go first. Yeah, Danny, go go ahead. Oh, okay. So, yeah, I agree with you um, in terms of, like, I think I was expecting more of, like, a... I don't know. I was expecting more of sort of, like, the... The the big, like, thing that happens, or, like, the... Like, a climax, like... But I don't really think that we... I don't know. I feel like we almost reached it before, like, in the last... In the last episode, in the first half. Like, I feel like, um... uh, Jethro Ferber didn't descend into madness like I was expecting. Or, like, in terms... You know, like, we... It wasn't really... Um, it, I don't know. It just wasn't what I expected in that way. I, I sort of expected him to just like keep rambling for the rest of the book. And, um, and he didn't, I mean, we had, you know, insight into his mind, but we also had moments of clarity where they're talking about Henry Pimber, where they're, ta- where he's talking to the, um, the townsfolk. Um, and also when he's talking to, uh, to Lucy. Um, and so, I don't know. I think um, I think I was maybe kind of waiting for something that never came, um, but it also really kept me engaged um, in that way. Like I was, I was really engaged to the end. I, I admit I was a little. I mean, like there were still, it, it was still a little confusing <laughs> um, because we we were still like very much in Jethro Ferber's mind um, for all of it, um, and and there were there were still paragraphs where he just sort of goes off and just like says random words for no reason. Um, you know, or thinks them. Um, yeah. But yeah, I don't know. I, I think that's, I was, it wasn't exactly what I was expecting, but I, I wasn't disappointed. Yeah. Yeah. I actually was like very pleasantly surprised by the second half. I like, I'll be honest. I, I said in the last episode that I didn't hate this book and I, I stand by that, but um, I was not excited about continuing to read like at all. I <laughs> really, it was just like, Oh, this is going to be a, a slug like I'm just I can't I don't know and I feel like I I felt that way for the first few sections like the first few chapters in this second half that were still pretty nonsensical and I didn't like I understood what was happening but it was still just like a lot um all very stream of consciousness and then um maybe like four or five chapters into where we were there was like a switch that everything became very clear. Like the they, there were a few chapters in a row that were very, very clear and had a lot of plot and like genuine conversation. And I was like, I understand what's happening and I like what's ha- like, I'm very interested in what's happening. Um, and then even past that, there were still chapters that were stream of consciousness, but I felt like I understood them so much better because I was so much more engaged with the plot. 
Um, yeah, I think that that going back and forth, even just talking about the madness of everything that like because Jethro Ferber's madness, Jamie and I briefly talked about it, but that it came in like manic episodes and instead of like a steady stream the whole time that like it kind of came and just related to what we already learned about his ailments as a child like that kind of helped spur that along as well Mm -hmm. yeah and I feel like I I don't know I feel like I felt bad for him (laughs) throughout a lot throughout a lot of and and we'll get to that a little bit later yeah so I I don't know I felt way more engaged in this second half after a a few chapters um which surprised me yeah, and, and I guess we can start getting into that now, um, especially because it kind of ties into something that, Jamie, you had mentioned earlier about one part that you particularly liked was with Ferber and Omen Setter speaking to each other with the two of them uh, alone. Mm-hmm. And uh, I just kind of want to get into that on something that was brought up at that time during that conversation that, you know, it got to a point where Ferber was almost doing these deeds because he thought it was right. Even though it seems like Ferber was kind of crazy. I think you had mentioned there was a specific moment where when he was talking about or thinking about spreading this misinformation that Omen said, or definitely did something to Henry Pember that it was done in a way of like, I think that Omen Setter is actually a bad person, especially in relation to his sick child where he wasn't going to get the doctor. That was kind of a big point where Omen Setter didn't want to do that. Yeah, um, so he thought that like in retrospect because he had already um, he had already told everybody that he thought Omen Setter did it or that yeah, Omen but, Setter did it But playing it to, to him thinking that. So like yeah. just, just as far as for, for both of you of like, you know, from my own perspective and from just kind of looking at the back of the book again – where it's talking about, like, this novel is illuminating the timeless questions about life, love, good, and evil, that there was going to be this strict dichotomy of, like, Omen Setter is good and Ferber is bad. Uh, that was kind of my perspective going into it. That's what it was going to be. Um, what did you guys kind of think about that? And, and with Ferber and with Omen Setter, did they fit into those roles? Or do you think there was uh, more of a gray area for one or both of them or none? I mean, I think there's definitely, like, the the very, like, typical question of, or, you know, the if there's a priest or a, a pastor, a preacher of any kind in a town, like, they must represent the good, I think, in, in sort of traditional, like, they represent the good or the godly or whatever. And I think in this case, we, it, I don't know, I just, I love the way that Jethro Ferber is written because, like, it's almost just like, I don't know. It's almost like seeing like sort of like a secret. It's like, you know, like seeing into the mind of like a a person who is like supposed to be very like godly and is in fact like very human and like um and and also like maybe not a good person. <laughs> Especially because you know? he gener- like, he generally did keep it together too. That was the thing. It's like when we got into these yeah. conversations, he would still be having these thoughts that because we were able to get into his head, we're like, "Oh my god." Like it still was never like something that was that you know, easy to read because it was still getting into some really dark places. But like at the same time, he's talking to multiple different people. And from what you can gather from how these conversations are going, though, I think we got some description that he's perceived as a weird guy from the townspeople. He was still speaking in a normal way and was still involved in the town activities as the preacher and not as much of an outcast necessarily, I suppose. Yeah, and I mean, like, even the, the 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 summary on the back of the book says, like, um, that he's a preacher crazed with a propensity for violent thoughts. And I, I think that's even understating it. Like, <laughs> it's not just, it's not just, like, he's just, like, a preacher who, like, sometimes sort of, like, has outbursts of, like, I don't know, being horny. Like, he, he's, like, a, he's, like, a fucked up guy. And, <laughs> like, he, and, and, but, like, I think it's, I think it's good. It was, like, almost, it was refreshing. It was, like, a good it was a good, I I enjoyed reading his character because I thought it was, um, I thought it was refreshing to read like a preacher in that way. I, I, I don't know. I, I, I just, I really like the way that the summary like of the book on the back, uh, the back of my edition at least like describes him because it just feels, um, it almost feels like it buries the lead a little bit. Like, Yes, he has a propensity for violent thoughts. Like, actually, he he only thinks, like, violent, erotic things, <laughs> so, like, most of the time. 
Yeah, he's also like, I don't know. I feel like I felt sympathy for him throughout part of this because, like, we learned a lot about his childhood in the first section, and he's clearly, like, very messed up in a lot of ways. Yes. But he also just seems... And I, I think this is almost true for Omen Setter, too. Just so caught up in his own perception of himself that he, like, can't imagine other people as complex human beings. Like, there was a really... It's just such a small moment, but uh, something that I thought was funny, because we mentioned it on the last episode, or at least last time we talked. I don't remember if it was recorded. That at the beginning of the book... Um, Omen Setter is referred to as Bracket, uh, but then suddenly they started saying Bracket, and we were like, yeah. "That's weird. Maybe that's a typo." But there's a literal section where like Ferber's talking to Matt, and he says Bracket, and Matt's like, "No, no, it's Bracket." He's like, "Oh, oh, is it?" And then he catches and he's himself been obsessed with this man, <laughs> yeah. and he didn't even know his name. And then he even caught himself when he was talking to Bracket later on. I think there's a section that he specifically was like, "Back, uh, Bracket." Yeah, I was like, this this man has been like you've you've been tumbling him over in your thoughts for so long and you don't even know his real name. Like that's absurd. Yeah, I I don't know that we I don't know that that was on the podcast. I, I don't remember like but I I remember reading that part and also I think after our first recording in between then and now being like I forgot to bring up that like he he was calling him back it for so long and I was like, what is going on? Yeah. Like, and then you and then you realize that like it's because he truly like has not bothered to try to know what it is. <laughs> yeah, no, he's so much more concerned with like his own perception of himself. And I think he sees Omen Setter as kind of a rival in a weird way. Yeah. Um for almost no reason. Mm-hmm. But that's such a weird thing for the rival because it's like hard to tell where uh, Ferber even stands anyway of like what is the opposite of Ferber that he's like fighting against with Bracken Omen Setter because uh, also I wanted to highlight one thing of like it's not like it was with Jethro Ferber where he was like kind of teetering on the edge of like you know he's a preacher and is like oh maybe my faith is you know not as good as I thought there's a literal part in our edition here in 259 where he says Matthew, listen, or I think he's thinking this, but like, Matthew, listen, believe in the devil. I know you for a man who merely believes in God, bad theology and careless observation, Matthew. You you can believe me for I have seen him. He and I are on familiar terms. He has a sharp tongue and strange ideas like myself. We are friends, in fact, men like no other. Like, Mm -hmm. it is just in very plain terms that like, this is something that he is embracing uh, uh, of, you know, the opposite side of what would, what the good would be in his own belief system. And so that's so fascinating on like what that makes Omen Setter in comparison, but also this is another thing, Jamie, you had briefly brought up. These are only off of like a couple sentences of conversation, but about like how you perceived Omen Setter. Like, did you think he was a good guy? Same thing to you, Danny. Like was Omen Setter a good and opposite person or, or how did you kind of think of Omen Setter's character once we got to the end and got to the whole arc of of his story here. Um, so last episode, this was the problem. Part of the problem that I had this, with this book in the first half was that I perceived Omen Setter as just a dude, like just a guy living his life. And I was like, why is everybody obsessed with him? Why is this book about everyone's perception of this very plain man who's just like raising his kids? Um, and I think that I still had that perception for a while throughout the second half, but at towards the end of the book, it sort of flips on you because there's this moment where Omen, Omen Setter uh, refuses to get the doctor for his dying baby son, and he's kind of going crazy a little bit at least that's how I interpret it like having sort of a manic moment like Ferber does where he's just like no this is this is my luck and this is better and he deserves to like either fight for his life or die if that's what God wants and blah blah 
Um, yeah, it was interesting that there was an acknowledge, acknowledgement of his own luck. That was yeah. soon after that part I had read. I think I said my, in my note here of 261, I think is the first time I noticed it. But like him actively referring to it and being like, oh, we're aware. Yeah. We and know he, that this like, is He mentions it a, more than once yeah. saying like, this is, it's Omen Setter's luck. It's my luck. I need to, like, he will be fine or he won't. And if he's not, it's God's will, whatever. Um, but I think that that shows us that he is similar to Ferber in a lot of ways of just being like caught up in his own perception of himself um even if it was like kind of subtle or subconscious for a long time I think that he is also a conceited person who uh wants to be viewed a certain way in society and that's just most of what he's concerned about yeah um but I thought that was interesting they're both like very they both ultimately are like concerned sort of like with their image like with, like uh, to these you know these like townspeople but i think omen setter especially like he talks a lot about um i don't know i almost found it a little like ironic that he talks about his luck or like fate or like leaving it up to like whatever god wants to do and like jethro ferber who is the who is the person who is supposed to sort of be the one who's like who you would expect to be like well just you know let sort of like let it be god's will whatever happens like they they, they're playing opposites in this way they're 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 you know not really doing what you would expect um they're not playing the role you would expect um and i i don't know i i thought it was interesting too like that he seemed so obsessed with um like the way he, you know, was perceived by this community, Omen Setter, I mean, um, and and being obsessed with his luck, it almost became like this weird pressure that he was feeling. Yeah. 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 It it was uh interesting to like see it from that outside perspective and then also just fascinating that in a book that I presumed we would get more of a detailed look into Omen Setter really didn't like get his full perspective at all like it was named omen setter's luck but he played a relatively minor role as far as even like quote unquote screen time here uh like we had freaking isra best or yeah isra best is taught had probably more time i i think like just around you know from with the townsfolk and everything, because like Omen said, it disappears for a lot of the book. Like he gets talked about a lot. Yeah. But even in those like times where he's talking about Omen Setter's luck and you're talking about, you know, how he seems to be going a little bit mad in those instances and like he had these instances of rage when people were even starting to like put the blame on him. I think there were a couple of times that he lost his cool. Um, we didn't get that inside look that I feel like was more apparent with other characters. Um, so like it's hard to even tell what that was like because again it was so revealing for Jethro Ferber how he could talk one way and be thinking such a drastically different way that um, I thought it was kind of cool in the end to um, leave Omen Setter to be like this ever-present myth uh, was just kind of an interesting tactic for the story Um, and so for the next part here just touching on you know, when everyone is blaming Omen Setter for Henry Pember's uh, disappearance and death, I just kind of want to get into those series of events um, and how that played out and just kind of get your perception on it. And if there is anything that you had picked up um, as far as anything to explain even what you think happened, I just kind of, this is kind of the uh, out there theory moment where you don't have to be right. I'm just curious on um, what you think uh, just because the mystery is never solved. It's not like um, where the crawdads sing. <laughs> We're at the end just like, here's this thing. And then, here's this. And also he was a poet. <laughs> yeah. uh, so, so, so I just kind of want to put conspiracy hats on here. I just kind of go around and, and hear what you have to say. And also what you kind of thought about um, the town's reaction to it and just kind of that whole part of the book, that series of events. So anywhere you want to start with that. James, you go. 
I don't know where I want to start. I don't know. I guess I could start with like theories of what happened. Yeah, yeah go for it. I don't know that I have a theory. I'll try to. Um, I don't know. I really, I, the conclusion that I was at at the end of the book is that I don't think that Omen Setter killed Henry, but I think that maybe he helped Henry kill himself. Um, hmm. And I don't, like, I don't know if that makes any sense. But, like, they said Henry was, like, kind of frail. He couldn't have climbed up that high. And I think I believe that Henry didn't seem that impressive. Uh, <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> I mean, he didn't. Below the belt right there. But I also don't think that Omen Setter would have killed him also their their whole proof that omen setter did it is like the rent money in the pocket so, yeah so goofy which like why wouldn't he take the money back if he just paid him and then killed him why wouldn't he just grab it back there's no reason and we'll write back around to that money when, uh, in a little bit i do want to hit on that uh where that money um, goes but so i the- think that that's nonsense i i don't think that omen setter was a um a dangerous presence necessarily I think he's kind of reckless but I don't think he's dangerous and I don't think he had any reason to hurt Henry um unless I need to go back and read reread Henry Pember's section because if you recall my original interpretation of their interaction was that they were in love with each other um, and it was going to be like a gay yeah. romance. Yeah. <laughs> Wait, that, the, do you mean do you mean Omen Setter and Ferber or Omen Setter and Pimber? Omen Setter and Pimber was Pimber. the was the theory from the last episode. Yeah. Right. We were looking forward to our boys and their relationship. <laughs> yeah. And, and then the, Pimber and disappeared, the and I thought it wedding. was because they were going to go meet each other off in their gay love zone. I don't know. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but that's not what happened. He died. Yeah, it was very opposite. We were we were having some very predictions. Not what we, were, we, were, we were having some predictions over here on this side of the table of a ride off in the sunset, and it was uh, hung in the middle of winter. In- instead, he yeah. maybe killed him. Yeah. So, but that's the thing. I feel like I I didn't go back and reread like any part of Henry's section. But those the last few pages that I talked about in last episode, where I was like, he keeps describing the way Omen Setter is looking at him and the way he's talking to him, and it feels very romantic. And maybe I totally misread it, and it was, like, really sinister. <laughs> like, I don't know. I think Omen Sitter just has that presence, though, because even Ferber, to some degree, started having those descriptions a little bit during their conversations, I started to notice, just because that was more in my mind uh, from, <laughs> from when it was brought up last episode. That, well, Ferber, that Ferber ha- also straight up says that he's had sexual relations with men and women. Yes, yeah, he, he yeah, did. He fully... Ferber is interested in the spectrum of yeah. all. Yeah, I mean, not, he nothing, is like I have been. Nothing was off limits. In all of it. Like I, he said, children too, just to like yeah. just to make <laughs> right. sure well, everything yeah, no. is represented here. Ferber was like a very much, if I can stick it, just sexual predator. It's good. <laughs> a little bit. Oh no. <laughs> He's specific. That's a direct quote, by the way. Ferber, Ferber did not discriminate. He did not discriminate. Yeah, it was not uh, good. That's what I'm saying. It's like, j- just to make it clear that, like, it's not, you know, we're, we have somewhat sympathies for Ferber, and, like, it could be explained by what was going on, but it never changed the fact that, like, the stuff that he described was absolutely terrible. It never oh, got yeah, better. No, it's it really never bad. never got better. Um, Earlier, it's horrifying. Yeah. Earlier in the podcast when you were summarizing and you said erotic corners and then you paused and said of his mind, I imagine... <laughs> just, that's the other corner of our podcast. <laughs> I imagine just All right. podcast so, yeah. <laughs> Erotic corners. We got a little wah guitar in the background. We so we have, got... We we got have- we got what are you drinking? We got in the media <laughs> section, erotic corner right before our fourth corner of actually talking about the book. <laughs> we have four corners to this yeah, podcast, and has- one of them is erotic corner. <laughs> James very much keeled over up, Mike. Uh, hey, let's consider. Let's let's wrap around back on that, you guys. Let's, yeah, no, you said that. erotic corner, and I also fully was I clocked it. <laughs> yeah. So everybody, you're one or two. No, <laughs> Since so last in episode. erotic corner this week. Um, 
<laughs> anyway, so yeah, yeah. I anyway. don't know. I that is. I think that that's my best theory because I feel like it is. It is too coincidental. It's too lucky that Omen Setter just looked up and found Henry. Um, and also, like, felt weird and guilty about telling the sheriff about it. Like, there is some yeah, what guilt was, there. Yeah, that was very strange. So that's why I feel like, I feel like he helped Henry commit suicide. I didn't know if it, yeah, I just don't know if it was, like, a guilt thing or if just, like, Omen said there's just some general problem with any person of authority. Because, like, then there's but the like, doctor situation. But, Ferber would be a person of authority in this very a discredited religious one. town <laughs> a fallen priest eh, i don't know <laughs> yeah that's so, my theory everyone. anyway uh yeah so with that Dan, any any thoughts on your side i don't know i don't know that i have like a specific theory all i know is that like the whole time i was like doubting that omen setter did it but then there were so many like indirect little like pieces of evidence that like seemed very sp- suspicious and like the rent money was like funny it was like silly but also like kind of like made a little bit of like it almost like sort of gave him this weird motive but also i love that it was a quote-unquote sign though that he was trying to send her like he gripped it extra hard before he got dropped down to get high as a sign to you just like like they it was there was so much there was so much like editorializing yeah. when it came to the money and I don't know it felt like a very frustrating true crime podcast or something <laughs> like you know like you're just like listening and listening and you're like waiting for it to, to like you know you're they're, like waiting they're for almost the... there but then you're just like hold on yeah no it's just like That's when like good. serial ended or whatever and it's just like oh at all the evidence points and then it's just like but like we don't know anything <laughs> and like that's how it felt and I don't, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think Jamie's theory is very interesting um, that he's somehow involved, but like not directly complete, like not directly like at fault. But I don't know. Like he disappears for a while. Assisted and, like, suicide of- versus murder. Yeah, I'm on yeah. assisted suicide. Team assisted suicide. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> like, can we talk about like what the, what his motive would be? Like what? What actual motive did would he have had? So, so that's what I'm none. Well, that's what that's what I'm thinking on the, like. For, for like what I'm kind of thinking though of, of anybody else that would have motive because that's what I was trying to think of like what would bring Omen Setter to do it and the only person I could really think of because there was already like a rift there anyway was Lucy his mm-hmm. wife because yeah. they had had like issues when Omen Setter came to town and I, I can't I wish I could recall more about what Ferber talked about with Lucy so early on because Ferber was like a direct cause to, and I'm not even saying that I have any evidence to tie these together, but just as far as like, again, putting on the tinfoil hat, but of like, you know, Ferber going in and trying to spread around that Omen said it was such a problem. And I know he had his own reasons for it anyway, but like Lucy Pember also was just very upset in the first place of this whole situation with Omen Setter in the first place. She was very unhappy that Henry allowed this to happen. And I think there were, I, I'm only thinking of this because of when I was just flipping through to remember the ordering of events for this back half of, of Ferber specifically talking about Lucy's mannerisms while they were talking and that she was very, um, willing to just kind of be quiet and listen and understand what he had to say. Um, I think Lucy did it. So, yeah, that's that's <laughs> up. so so that's that that's what all, all I'm saying from your side of things is like what motive would Brackett have even had? I I couldn't think of any because he only stood to benefit from the relationship from Henry anyway. Yeah, I don't. I st- I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. So we don't and we don't have to get much deeper than that. I was just curious on on the thoughts on it because because it didn't get solved. I don't know that it necessarily needed to um cuz this is going to kind of get us to the end here. Uh, after that it all happened. Uh as we had mentioned it was a relatively light ending here where it was never really decided on that uh that omen setter had even done it. We have a brief moment where 
Ferber's uh, manic side comes out publicly, um, <laughs> which which leads to him getting replaced in the end. But but that was uh, actually kind of a nice thing. I'll bring this up as a side note because we had talked about how um, the language was so poetic in a specific moment. I, I think it was the section when he was talking to the old preacher um and he just was going through one of these manic states and it was getting very poetic uh and had all these alliterations and had all of these you know different limericks and different things like that where those came to the fore again i thought that that was kind of a nice wrap back to go full circle for his section i really en- enjoyed that coming back out that even in the midst of all of that that the townsfolk were like it was pretty good. Like, like in the middle of that all happening, I thought that, that was kind of like a humorous part to bring down such a tense part of the book where literally while this is happening, a bunch of them are like, some of them are like, hey, Ferber, can you shut the hell up? And, and then the others are just like, hey, man, I'm actually digging this. This is pretty good stuff. Um, but eventually it, it we get this new priest in here and Omen Setter leaves and it kind of brings it all back around. So I kind of wanted to get your guys' thoughts on the ending and, and if you thought it wrapped things up and, and just any other parts about that that stuck out to you and, and how that all played out for everybody. Danny, go. <laughs> so, I don't know. I mean, I don't. I wouldn't call it a satisfying ending, but also... I think that we sort of like ended it the way that we began. Like we sort of just like yeah, that definitely. We just like entered into this like stream of consciousness of like a few people, and like we exited pretty much the same way. Like it was sort of wrapped, but it, it I don't know. Like it, it was sort of just like um, I thought it was interesting that the most clarity for me, the most clear parts of the book happened in the last like three pages. Like. There was like there was such there was like no um, clarity about things like that happened. Like I think Corey mentioned this in our Steppenwolf episode, but he said something like there were there were there were like no verbs, <laughs> like nothing was like happening. And like I I thought about that when I was reading the second half of this book specifically because I there was so much talk and there was so much you know Jethro talking to Omen Setter and Omen Setter and the townspeople and Lucy and they're just all talking to each other and I felt like there was very little like there were there were few verbs like there were there was very little like actually happening and um except for there were like a few pages at the end where it actually does wrap it up it says like uh Omen Setter moved here this is what happened to Ferber like you know it's it's very and this is what happened to the money that Ferber um you know, that Ferber has and Yeah, that was uh, Ferber's final approval of this new preachers. He overheard one of his sermons and was like what, I can't remember what it specifically he said. He gave the rent money. Yeah, I know, but he called it oh, a the, specific thing. Yeah, uh, to like um, the new preacher, right? Yeah, yeah he, he called it um, he, he said this determined him after he had heard such a good uh sermon, he said this determined him to slip what he called Henry Pember's hanging money. In one of Mr. Huffley's bright new offertory envelopes before he left. Yeah, so like this is like Ferber's like weird endorsement, and I, I, I which don't I know. guess it's semi unclear if he's dead or not. But he was pretty sick, so I don't know if like he left his death or or whatever else. I, I don't know where else he could yeah, go. Yeah, I don't know where um, else he could. I go. mean, like pneumonia not to go out and on, madness. Yeah. I mean, not to go off on a tangent, but also like you have both been talking about his death, and like absolutely, I probably, but also like. The ending just says he before he left. And I, I mean, I know, I don't know. I think we can safely assume he probably died, but I don't know. I, I, I did feel, though, that, like, there were some of the clearest moments of the book happened at the end for me. Um, and I don't really know. I don't really know what that what that says or what that means. But I, I just um, in terms of, like, being wrapped up, I thought it was I thought it was interesting to actually be able to have a little bit of of. Um, uh, of of clarity of of like a wrap up at the end like we know where Omen Setter was we know where Ferber was like we know where where Pember was and so uh, we know where the money was <laughs> and so <laughs> the um, all important there question. were there were there were there were very few verbs in the second half in terms of like things happening but um but you know we we got 
we got a little bit of um, closure um, with, I think, the, the main people we were following. So I thought it was, I don't know, kind of satisfying in that way. Yeah, I don't really know how I feel <laughs> about the last few pages. I really don't. I've been sitting here looking at them being like, what did I, what did I think? Um, I feel like I enjoyed everything leading up to like the last little mini chapter so much that I kind of just ignored the fact that the last chapter is just kind of like whatever <laughs> like I I agree I think it kind of it ties it up into a nice little bow almost too much for what nonsense this book is in half of it yeah. like I yeah. I think I was surprised that it was like oh and this is where uh Omen Setter went and his family was happy and they did not get arrested <laughs> and the baby lived and uh yeah like it's very and it is acknowledged about how like short it is in the afterward just because I was looking at the very beginning he does kind of mention it I'm, Danny does your copy have the afterward as well yeah which is a whole other can of worms I, I don't know if we're gonna be able to get to I it I didn't read it I don't, I don't know if we're gonna be able to get to it because there's not much time left here but if you do uh have that it's just interesting to read I don't know how like fictionalized that afterward actually was because it was like kind of crazy just the, the the too long don't read he said that somebody might have stolen the previous manuscript when we had said he had like it was lost and he just went into this kind of uh long wraparound way of like and this guy's the worst and he plagiarizes and it seemed like he was so, joking it seemed like he was joking we, no, we, but we don't have to get into it though because yeah <laughs> i mean okay I, I just one thing when i first read about the manuscript getting lost and or stolen like i the the lore is that it was stolen and prob I mean most likely because of this. But afterward. he names a name. That's the crazy thing. It's not <clears> like <throat> he said somebody. He names like a specific pr professor guy and he like brings <laughs> him up multiple times. It's crazy. Yeah. And he I said he know. almost ran him over because some guy looked like him. So anyway, I'd say if you get to the afterward, read it because like I can't tell how fictional it is. It is semi interesting to get into. But uh, with that. We're kind of uh, getting to the end here. Want to hit some final thoughts. Um, and one thing that I didn't get to, I don't know if you just want to like maybe touch on it just a little bit on even if you find any relation to it. But one of the things that um, even drew me to choose this book for um, the back half of our season, I was kind of going back and forth on on a few choices before we went public with it um, at the end of book four. But we had had a couple instances of Southern Gothic at the beginning of our season. And I think some people on Goodreads had said something about this being like a Midwestern Gothic. Obviously, it takes place in Ohio, blah, blah, blah. Do you see similarities to specifically um, As I Lay Dying and Sing Unburied Sing? Those were the two um, notable instances of earlier in the season. Um, so just if you want to touch on that you know you can or can't but i'm just curious about that because i think we kind of mentioned that um we may touch on that this episode and yeah the general final thoughts subject matter here do you like the book how did the second half relate to the first some stuff that we've kind of touched on but just anything else you want to hit on before we get out of here um to answer your gothic question a little bit I guess. I don't know. I think there's parts of it that I can relate to As I Lay Dying um, in the style and themes. Uh, but honestly, throughout reading it, I'll, and this is maybe just such a surface level thing, but the books that I kept thinking about were uh, The Crucible and The Scarlet Letter, mostly because their settings are very similar. Yeah, I was going to say, the setting definitely... But also, they are all... They're both about books that, like... Are, they're accusing a really innocent person of something really absurd. Yeah, and it gets to be mob mentality pretty quickly. Yeah. yeah. Um, so that's, those are the things that I kept thinking of, about while I was reading it, um, which did make me like it better also, I think. Like this, I don't know, this time period never seems that interesting to me, but then I do really love The Crucible, like very genuinely. 
Um, so that there was some nostalgia there, I think. Um, I don't know if this is a final thought. I don't really know. I, I don't know what my final thoughts are, but I have definitely that you seem to like it more this on the second half from what I it sounded like. I definitely do, and I, I today the parts that I read today, I genuinely was so engaged in, and I really, really loved. And I highlighted a bunch of different quotes that I didn't bring up. Um, but one quote that I highlighted that I really like and I wanted to talk about said, uh, it was Ferber talking or Ferber thinking, I think, I don't think he's talking. Um, he's just, (laughs) there's a probably if you could guess on what was going on, he was probably, he he was probably thinking about the thing to, he thinks so much. Yeah. The thing to speak ratio is (laughs) (laughs) Um, thinking he was thinking about religion and about God and there's a lot of him doing that just on his own in this second half of like about God and the devil and also maybe he doesn't believe but maybe he does I always did love those sections I thought those were great and there's he touched on him even on the last or the first half as well yeah there was a quote though where he said um but he really wanted to embrace the body of the symbol but the body of every symbol was absurd And I really liked that quote because it made me think of the short story by Stephen Crane, The Open Boat, um, which has like a really similar line that says like, he wanted so badly to throw bricks at the temple um, and he was upset to realize that there were no bricks and no temple. Um, And I just like, I don't know. I think that there's a really interesting thread throughout this about religion. And I think I always sort of, sympathize with characters who are losing faith (laughs) I don't know I really I I find that so fascinating and I think that that was a really interesting part of Ferber's character that he is his whole life is religion but he is not religious um or he might be a satanist maybe (laughs) <laughs> um, like he all he seems to think that it's just all absurd and then on that the last page too he says he's talking to somebody and he says like what will become of me oh no I I know what will become of me I've already become it and I'm just like I <laughs> <laughs> I really I I liked this book a surprising amount I don't know how I'll, I don't know how to wrap Yay. that up I really like <laughs> I thought it was going to be a Vineland, and this episode I was going to be like, Brian, why'd you make me read this? I had multiple moments that I myself was like, oh, I've created that experience for myself. Yeah. <laughs> no, I it, really- It got better. I think that I'll think about it for a long time. Nice. That's my final thought. I I think that I am- uh, I don't know. It was not a Vineland for me, but I also- <laughs> that. That is just the stamp now. Is it? <laughs> the worst book is just I mean, A. Vineland. You can all visit my Goodreads. Um, <laughs> but also, I don't know. I, uh, I, I, like I said in the last episode, I think that I was absolutely much more prepared to read this book because of reading Vineland. Um, it worked. <laughs> <laughs> Brian must be stopped. Um, I... I don't know. I think that I still, um, in terms of like just general enjoyment, like I didn't have a great time reading this book. It was, it was a little stressful. Um, but also like I was, I was, I think the difference between sort of like Vineland being one of the first books of this kind that I sort of read, like that's why I keep, that's why we keep talking about it. Um, I think the difference is that, um, I, I was more invested and engaged, um, in this story um and yeah i don't know like jamie said i i um i'm inter- i'm always interested in characters like jethro ferber specifically it remind he reminded me a little bit of i don't remember his name um the 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 religious figure in rabbit run um mm-hmm. a little bit i mean just in terms of like i i think it's always interesting to be in the mind of like a um, a person of faith, quote unquote, who is like absolutely questioning and like actually like 
maybe not even of faith any longer. While being um, a leader of also, like that's a whole while other While being like has. a literal like leader and example of, of faith. And I, I think, I think that, um, like authors really do it. Some authors do a really great job of like pointing out sort of like the hypocrisies of like the pedestals that we, you know, we put like, like preachers and pastors on. Um, and and I really I really enjoyed um, I enjoyed parts of of um, the erotic corners of Jethro Ferber's mind, <laughs> which is a uh, new staple of this show. <laughs> <laughs> the erotic corners of Jethro Ferber. Um, I don't know. I um, I I do like I stand by I think what I said last episode, which is that I enjoyed this more than I expected to. Um, I I think I actually will go back and like even like read the last few chapters again and the afterwards specifically. Um, uh, just because I, I think that it, this kind of book like warrants um, a few sort of like one like not a once over but rather like a, a few times over um, being able to like internalize and, um, and like understand what's happening because I think the lack of uh, quotes is, is hard for me like just um, practically speaking like the lack of there was one I, I noted it. I saw a quotation mark. I think there were a couple. Yeah, I think there were maybe two. I, I think for the edition. They were that, in weird places. The edition that we Where both have. Where and why? Page 212 is what I have marked down when I did find an instance of a quotation mark. Not to not to derail from your comment, but I did think that was particularly insta- uh, interesting enough to note it down where I was like, whoa, why is this here? Yes. Yeah. No, I. Okay, I see it. Um. But, yeah, but not know. not to take I... away from your point. Obviously, that's like a very vast <laughs> Danny, minority. You're wrong. A very, there were no, no, a very vast throughout? minority of this Excuse of this me? novel. <laughs> no, uh, yeah, and I mean, I I think practically speaking, like overall, that that is hard. It's hard for me to read, and it's hard to keep track of. But also, I understand that like that's the point. Um, sometimes, like especially like at the end when all the townsfolk are talking, like I am still, I was still finding myself being like, who's talking and who are these initials mm-hmm. referencing and like and and and. The point is that it doesn't actually matter um, yes. most of the time. Um, <laughs> and so, uh, I, I mean, I, I, I enjoyed it for, for all of those reasons. Um, I think, um, yeah, I, I, I was surprised by how much I enjoyed it. Um, and I, I'm not, you know, this has inspired me to, uh, to read the, uh, the book of novellas that I have of William H. Gass, yeah. which I bought five years ago and have not read. I brought that up because I, <laughs> I didn't know you had that. Well, she brought it up on the last I, episode, maybe. I very randomly, or maybe like, not. Oh, I don't think no, so. I think I just brought it up to Brian. I very randomly five or six years ago at a book fair in Chicago, um, I bought a book, a William H. Gass novella book, um, because I liked the cup, the, the cover, <laughs> um, <laughs> It's called Cartesian Sonata, and I or something Sonatas, maybe plural. And anyway, I I opened it and I started it, and I whatever six years ago I was like, what the fuck is happening? And I promptly closed it. Um, and I uh, I don't know. I mean, I'm I am interested in reading more of him. I have context now, and I am I appreciate it. I have heard that his short stories are particularly of note, and I I posted this episode on Reddit. Uh, and it actually surprisingly gained some traction. A lot of people were talking about William H. Gass, and they mentioned that specific book that you had talked about. Um, oh. And they were saying that they really enjoyed that collection and, and different things like that. So um, I'm, I may be curious to read it as well, just to kind of see what he is like within the short story um, framework. Uh, yeah, just like um, a quick side note. This is somewhat unrelated, but... Uh, <laughs> On William H. Gass's Wikipedia page, there's a whole subheading that's just William H. Gass on metaphor. And I read that today. So uh, <laughs> Whoa. Getting deep on this research. He, he wrote his whole dissertation about the idea of metaphor. <laughs> oh, yeah. I browsed that. <laughs> Which I um, thought was funny. I don't know. One last thought um, that I didn't reference, which was um, sort of like a Southern Gothic comparison. I just finished 500 pages worth of Flannery O'Connor's complete short, short stories. So Southern Gothic is top of mind that, for me. That was the beginning of this season also, because you picked that up right before we started our first episode of As I Lay Dying. Yeah, we're really coming full circle here. Um, <laughs> I... oh. Yes, Danny. 
so sorry. <laughs> um, I, uh, yeah, I, I picked it up, um, uh, at the beginning of the season and we've sort of come full circle with, uh, with Flannery. Um, but I, I do think like there are definitely some similarities. Like, um, I, I think, I don't know. I think I would call it sort of like a Midwestern Gothic, um, because the, the stream of consciousness writing aside, like, um, I, I definitely, I don't know. I, I, there were some similarities like with the setting, um, and with the, sort of the small town, um, uh, you know, sort of introspective vibe, uh, that I got. And I, I think it was interesting to like finish up Flannery O'Connor and, and finish this book too. Such a vibe. <laughs> <laughs> vibe. Such a vibe. Um, yeah, for final thoughts, uh, getting to the end of it and and kind of seeing how the style of this novel played out. Um, again, the stream of consciousness aside, the lack of quotation marks and the way that those conversations were structured, um, I actually thought, you know, there's a lot of novels that I like that have experimental structures, but it's not something where I just see something experimental and it's like, oh, that's automatically like A plus in my book. I like for it to have somewhat of a purpose. And for me in this novel, it felt like having so many townspeople that were involved in a small way without you needing to actually care about them and like needing to call them out every time and describe everything about them, but just like have their name in your mind and that they are a part of this broader conversation. I actually ended up liking that mass grouping of conversation where it wasn't broken up by like, Oh, you know, this person said, and that person said, and that person said, especially when we're getting to those moments where like all the townspeople are together and it's getting to this point of where, the search party's there and they're asking questions uh, of the Omen Setter family. Like I thought that that style ended up actually playing a very positive role into my enjoyment of the novel and overall the flow in all honesty, because I can only imagine what a lot of those scenes would be like if they were fleshed out that much more of like needing to explain uh, where each person was sitting, what they were saying at what time, who was saying what, um, so I did enjoy that, and and I like that the style seemed to make a difference in this case. Um, and overall, um, as has been said, I think the novel definitely grew on me. I had low moments where I was, as I mentioned earlier, thinking, like, what have I done? <laughs> I, I was even at a point where I was like, I don't know if I'm going to enjoy this, but it really did come back around, and uh, I enjoyed Ferber much more as a character knowing where he ended up where like his ending was just so so much more lighthearted than I could have ever imagined from where the story started out and the depths that we got to within his mind that he could have such an ending where it was just kind of like a teehee here's this money and he gave it to the next guy like it was just kind of a funny thing to to see where he ended up um, after everything we learned about him. So, uh, yeah, the, the, the novel is definitely uh, an interesting read, and, and I'm glad we went along in the ride. As far as the Midwestern Gothic, um, I could see some similarities just from all of the different uh, characters and their thought processes. I think that when we were starting to get into a lot of as I lay dying with getting into everybody's mind and how they um, talked about it and how everybody else was just kind of like not as much of a big focus when we were uh, within the head of whoever it was we were focusing on. It was like that, but just a bit wider, obviously with uh, a larger focus on fewer characters, most, uh, prominently Jethro Ferber but yeah it was uh a good read and I'm, I'm glad we got to the end of it together here this is the fifth book of season two that we have officially finished which means we have two more I'm hoping we can get this one uh this season done at a similar pace to not not even pace but similar time frame to last year where we had our last episode towards the end of the year for our season finale. There's definitely a possibility for that. 
because uh, we have two more. But uh, now that we're on the subject and because we're moving into our next book next time, let's just hit the next two that we're hitting in the order. So for book number six... We are reading The Master and Margarita by Mikhail Bulgakov. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Nailed it. The confidence. <laughs> and, and for book number seven. We are reading Oryx and Crank by Margaret Atwood. So that'll be two episodes for each of those, four total. And then we will have a fifth episode. That will be the season finale where we will do our rankings I'm actually looking forward to that. I was uh, looking back on it. It was just kind of fun to go around and have it reveal the way that it did about uh, our favorite books. And I think even Lee's favorite book, if I recall correctly, from the season. So <laughs> we'll see how it wraps up with the last two. Uh, but yeah, with that, I think we're going to call this one good. We need a scat. And I think, from what I recall, the last two have come... From this side of the screen. <laughs> so I think that means it's uh, tossing over to downtown to get a nice, <laughs> get a nice <laughs> downtown, downtown. <laughs> a little nice downtown a scat. downtown flavor. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Just, I love the downtown stylings of scat. <laughs> The, the I was just Kansas thinking, City jazz. <laughs> truly, I was just thinking five minutes ago that I really need to brush up on my, uh, on my, on my scatting knowledge. <laughs> uh, it's too late. You're you're now in the spotlight. So, uh, Danny, take us out with a uh, scat to end Omen Setter's luck. You know what? I'm gonna do a little beer time with books and wine. <laughs> <laughs> Squeep a squeedle doodle. Squeedle doodle. Whoa! Squeak squeak. Squee. <laughs> Truly incredible. We will <laughs> catch you next time. Bye. Bye. Bye.